Hey everyone, welcome to Dask Demo Day. Uh, today we've got four presenters. We've got uh, Jacob talking about Rapids users. We've got Matt talking about TPCH benchmarks. Uh, and we've got Joe talking about Array Lake. And then we've got Matthias talking about Fontent. Um, so that I will turn it, I, I guess I'd ask everyone, uh, if you're not presenting to mute yourself. Um, and then, yeah, with that, I'll hand it over to Jacob. Great, thanks. Um, this is like less of a demo of like me showing cool tech stuff, more of a demo of me talking about like use cases and what people are doing with Dask and Rapids together. Um, this was partly like, a, this was partly solicited by Matt uh, just for us to do a bit of outward communication. And it's been fun to do some maybe introspection uh, as part of setting up for this. Maybe I should start very quickly with like, what is Rapids? For those of you in the room that don't know what Rapids is, Rapids is like a, an open source group at NVIDIA and beyond that focuses on making GPU accelerated libraries for like the PyD tree ecosystem. So a lot of our libraries are like API compatible with existing things. We have QDF that looks like Pandas. We have QML that looks like Scikit-Learn, et cetera. We also work a lot on like integrating and making data interchangeable and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we use Dask a lot and our customers use Dask a lot. And so this talk is kind of, this little bit of it is, is about kind of what folks are doing and who's using it and trying to gather some some ideas of, of what scale people are using things. So I've been told that we've kind of verified that about 25% of the Fortune 100 are using Rapids. A good chunk of them are using Rapids and Dask, like actively, daily, doing real work. Um, I found a slide with loads of logos on and I put that on this slide. That may or may not be the best use of this slide. Um, but to try and quantify like size of companies, like NVIDIA typically goes after very large organizations. And so like we we have like a focus on large enterprises. And so like this is a number that people get excited about, right? It's 25% 20, of Fortune 100 are using Rapids in within their workloads. Um, I also was just having a look at like how our community has been growing over time. Um, and the like main takeaway I got from looking at download numbers and stars and all that kind of stuff is it's just it's pretty linear. Like just since Rapids has been created, it's been a straight line and it just goes up. If you look at GitHub stars as an example, we tend to add about a thousand GitHub stars every year uh, to projects like QDF. And that's just kind of been ongoing. So, yeah, it's just kind of this this continual growth. But I think one of the things that we see a lot is that. We're building stuff on top of these libraries and, and kind of giving those to customers uh, and getting users into those. And so those people are not necessarily even aware that they're using Dask or QDF or whatever under the hood because they're using some higher abstraction or tool. Um, so it's fun to see this kind of growing in this way, despite the fact that we keep adding more and more projects to our kind of remit of projects. So like a high level, I tried to boil down a bunch of like customer use cases. I'm going to dig into some actual examples in a second, but like we really see a lot of people using Dask with QDF and XGBoost. That seems to be like a really big, like bread and butter wrappers use case of, I've got like a terabyte or so of data. I want to train some model. I want to do HPO. I'm going to use Optuna or whatever. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to do some risk assessment or something in the in financial services, or I'm going to do some, some predictive, um, you know, cost prediction or uh, that kind of stuff. We also see uh, there's been like a lot of work recently. Everybody's obsessed with LLMs. There's been a lot of work internally on, you know, LLM based tooling, but there's been a big piece of work around uh, doing pre-processing of data before you go into training an LLM. That's what been built out with, with Dask. Um, and it's kind of a fun example. These are much larger data sets as well, which is neat. Um, and then we see like, we see a lot of people using Apache Beam and I'll talk a bit about Apache Beam in, in a little while. Um, and then there's like a, there's a group of folks uh, that are, doing work with, with graph neural networks. But these, these people come from, you know, these customers come from all sorts of different sectors. Um, some of these folks are spending like six or seven figures a month on like GPUs on the cloud uh, to just to run Dask clusters and do like Dask QDF workloads with XGBoost or something. And some of these clusters have got like a hundred GPU workers in their, in their cluster. And these might be on like Google or Azure or whatever, but we see a lot of on-prem, you know, people will go out and they'll buy a bunch of NVIDIA machines and they'll, string them together and have Slurm to schedule them or whatever. And it feels very, you know, academic HPC world. So to dig in some like actual use cases, uh, I've just grabbed a few things from, from previous GTC talks, because these are things I can talk about publicly without worrying about dropping names that I shouldn't drop. 
Um, so one example I've got here, uh, this is from a couple of years ago, this one, but this is Spotify doing uh, model evaluation. And this is using Dask and QDF to kind of load and model output. Um, and like the main thing that they seem to care about here is the out of core functionality of Dask data frame. They've just got these, these data sets that are larger than the memory of the GPUs in their machines, and they just want to do out of core computation. So they're using QDF to accelerate, uh, you know, whatever it is they're doing to their data. Um, and then they're using Dask QDF to get the, the out of core functionality. The next one I grabbed was uh, some slides from Peloton. Uh, they were talking about the fact that they use Spark for doing their like data pre-processing and their, you know, their, basically their ETL stuff. Um, and it's always interesting to compare like Dask's ETL to Spark's ETL. And you know, we end up having these talks with customers a lot. But then when they're done getting the data out of wherever it's stored with Spark, they then feed that into MV Tabula, which is like a, a tool that we have that's built on Dask and QDF. Uh, and it kind of, it just provides like a different API on that. Uh, Rick is on the call and I'm sure can can talk about MV Tabula uh, at length, but this is one of those things, this is one of those situations where people may not know directly that they're using like Dask and QDF, they're using MV Tabula, but like underneath it is it is using these other tools. And then that'll go into some, some model training that's all part of, of uh, NVIDIA Merlin. So this is quite an interesting one. I kind of like it because it's like Spark handing off to Dask, handing off to some other tool um, within the same within the same compute. Now these are these are like quick demos, right? So I'm going to keep going with like some speed. But if folks want to like ask me questions at the end, uh, I can always jump back. Um, I liked this example. This was kind of a fun one. This is doing like signal processing, uh, and it was a, a consultancy called T Systems. You can probably tell by the logo. They have they share the same parent company as T Mobile. Um, so they they are, but they're kind of a consultancy firm and they drop into large orgs. And so they've done a bunch of work with some very large car manufacturers that you will have heard of um, that I can't name drop, but they are taking telemetry data out of cars in some bespoke proprietary format. Uh, and one of the things they were doing is just converting it into something that's easier to work with. So they were, they had this big data pipeline of ingesting vehicle data. Um, and they were using QDF and Dask. And this was all on like a big slam cluster that they had access to. Uh, and they were running these these like Dask CUDA uh, slam clusters. And it's kind of fun to see them, you know, give talks about how this is working, but also like use our materials from the Dask documentation in their slides to show how they'd set up their clusters and stuff. Um, but this is using Dask QDF and, and they're basically using the read CSV functionality in there um, to load the data in. And I mentioned this like LLM stuff. So there was a fun blog post on, on NVIDIA's developer blog recently about like pre-processing data for training large language models. One of the things this group's been doing is focusing on like data deduplication. So if you take one of these data sets that's like every page on the web, um, there's some like tangible benefit to removing all of the duplicate content, all of the duplicate pages before you feed it into the model for training. Um, and so there's been some work on a project inside NVIDIA called uh, Nemo Data Curator. And this is built with Dask, uh, to kind of go through and do this, uh, you know, extraction and fuzzy deduplication. And these are on some really nice big uh, large data sets. And again, this is like a this is running on a, an HPC with Slam um, using Dask to to kind of chug through these large data sets. Uh, and then I think this is the last like, little use case I wanted to talk about is like we see a lot of people using Apache Beam. Like, Apache Beam seems to be very popular at Google and and in communities around that. Um, and Alex, uh, Google Research added Dask as a backend to Apache Beam a while ago. Um, and we have internally within NVIDIA, we see a lot of Apache Beam usage. And I think because we're quite, as an organization now, we're very proficient at running Dask internally. And we see a lot of people that like Beam, they're kind of latching onto the like, oh, I can get Dask and I can use Beam and I like the Beam API and I can just set one thing on top of the other. So it's not the most like sophisticated Dask use case, right? It's just Dask bag on top of a large cluster. Um, but then they're doing some kind of fun Apache Beam workloads on top of that using using GPUs. So like the last little thing I wanted to cover on this, because which I was thinking about based on like how this demo came about and talking to folks is like, it's hard for people, I think, within the DAS community necessarily to quantify what's going on inside Rapids. And I was just thinking a bit about like, why is that? Why is it not so visible about all of these things that are going on, right? Like big people are using Rapids with Dask like daily. Um, it's just kind of hard to see that going on. Uh, and so some of the things we we're, we were chatting about and thinking about is that, you know, we typically target large enterprises. Uh, those enterprises are less likely to raise issues on GitHub and communicate in the public space 
Um, and they often have an existing relationship with us. So they will come to us directly. They'll speak to our solutions architects. They'll speak to our sales teams. And that will filter through to us uh, engineers working on DASC and tools around it. Um, all those conversations will happen in the Nemo project or they happen in the Merlin project or they happen in you know places around DASC, but not in DASC itself. And so hopefully this, this kind of quick demo has given you a bit of a, an overview of, of what people are doing here with DASC and how we're using it and, and how we're building on it. Um, but it's also maybe think about like, maybe we should do this more often. Maybe we should do better at this. Maybe we should build out more use cases. So if you have interest in any of this stuff or you want to hear more about anything in particular, um, let me know. We could do a more deeper dive demo on one particular setup or one particular use case if that would be would be fun and interesting. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I'm probably roughly at my time. So hopefully that was uh, useful. Perfect. Thank you, Jacob. Okay. Um, thank you, Jacob. Uh, Matt, you want to take over? Yeah, sure. So let's see. There's this repository, which I think is public, uh, called Benchmarks, where we've run a bunch of stuff. Uh, recently, we added TPCH, and I want to talk a little bit about that. This is mostly summarizing the work that's happened over the last like week. Uh, maybe it was a couple more weeks earlier before that that prompted that. So yeah, TPCH, Spark, Dask, DuckDB, and Polars. I ran a bunch of experiments last night. I want to show some results, which are fun. For background, uh, historically, Dask data frame has been pretty bad at benchmarks. This is either because Dask data frame is hard to use well, or it's easy to use poorly, maybe. And I don't know, it's been weird. We've always like performed poorly. We've never really cared. Um, recently, we started making some things better, and we just sort of wanted to see what happened. So this chart was taken from Polars. This is the TPCH benchmarks, and it's queries one to seven. Um, one to eight, I guess. And Dask is this line that's red. It's probably hard to see. It's this red line, which is like, it's very, very tall. It's sort of tall enough. It doesn't make sense to, to plot anymore. Same with pandas. Uh, libraries that do do well are DuckDB and Polars. This is from Polars, so they better something do well. These queries, so we decided to run these queries, like not really where we think of Dask as being strong. It's a lot of merges. It's a lot of group buys. It's reading from Parquet. It's like the kind of thing you sort of expect a database to do well. But we just had to run them recently with some recent changes. Dask data frame got a bunch of performance changes over the last year, let's say. Uh, first, Pandas 2.0 came out. That brought in PyArrow strings. It also brought out copy and write, which isn't on yet for these results. We changed our shuffling algorithm a lot. You may hear this, hear this called P2P shuffling. Uh, we also added query optimization in this library called Dask Expression. It's not a mainline Dask yet, but it's quickly becoming our, our default internally. And so with these three changes, we want to see how, how does that affect these benchmarks we just get like slammed before. Um, and so we ran that again. And it so this is previous results. This is running on a 16 core machine on GCP. This is how the Polaris folks ran it. I just ran it on, my, on our laptop. And this is the results. And so I'm just going to show you a bunch of slides like this for different scales and hardware. Starting off, this is on my MacBook Pro. It's like got Chrome running in the background. It's a very messy environment. And it's the same data set size as what we saw with Polars, the scale 10, which is roughly 10 gigabytes. It's actually like four or five on disk. And so you can see uh, Dask, DuckDB, Polars, and PySpark. And we're going to compare those four libraries across a variety of scales. So we'll increase the scale, the size of the data set, from 10 gigabytes to 100 gigabytes to 1,000 gigabytes. We'll also change the compute architecture from my MacBook Pro to 32, core, 32 cores on the cloud to 128 cores on the cloud. And we'll look at those differences. And it's kind of fun to see how the libraries react to those different systems. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to go through charts, put these all together this morning. So first, my MacBook Pro. First, Dask is no longer dog slow. It is no longer very, very, very slow. And we can be happy and happy about that. But also like DuckDB is killing it. DuckDB is just like way faster than everybody else. It's actually really, really impressive as a technology. Other things to note, uh, Polars also, Polars and DuckDB, I think are both well optimized for the 10, gig 10 gigabyte scale. They both do way better than Dask and Spark. In general, it's gonna be kind of a correlation between DuckDB and Polars and between Dask and Spark as we go through these things. Also note that like Dask isn't way slower than Spark. And that's been the way things have been for a long time. Actually, we're 
fast in the spark on this sort of single machine case. Um, we're going to increase the scale now from 10 gigabytes to 100 gigabytes. Um, and I want to sort of, uh, yeah. So a few things to note um, this is on a messy machine. And I think some systems like Spark, for example, weren't designed to run on very messy machines. That's why they're actually, they're not present here. PySpark crashed a bunch on my machine. I think PySpark was designed to run with like all the memory of a computer and that just like, it didn't have access to that memory. Polar's also crashed a couple of times. Uh, Dask was kind of slow, but always ran. Uh, and then DuckDB is just like still humming along. Query seven, DuckDB doesn't like, but like otherwise DuckDB is definitely killing it. Um, but it was fun. Dask actually has the like the most robustly not terrible results, which is fun. So again, this is on a MacBook Pro, 100 gigabyte data set. I'm gonna move on. I'm actually gonna go back briefly to the 10 gigabyte data set. This is like the sort of easy safe case. And now rather than change the scale, to larger, I'm going to change the compute environment. I'm going to go from my MacBook Pro to 32 cores in the cloud. Um, and that's what this looks like. So some brief notes. Uh, for DuckDB and Polars, those are single machine projects. So we're, we're responding one 32 core VM. Take and or, uh, for Dask and Spark, we're also using 32 cores, but we're spreading them out across eight VMs of four cores each. Um, some things to just notice is that just like everything is normalized. Uh, the like the variance is quite a bit lower. Um, yeah, but DuckDB and Polar still do quite well. Dask and Spark have like had their have had their like lag decrease, but the still there's some good, good stuff here. I'm now going to increase from 32 core from scale 10, 10 gigabytes to 100 gigabytes. Um, and we can see that change here. So same hardware infrastructure, but just a larger data set. Some things to note. Uh, so Polar's stops doing well generally. And also I should also note that uh, Polar's like just added S3 access. They're moving super fast. It's probably not fair to like include them in this just yet. I expect the polar numbers to go way down in the future. Um, um, they're like they're very they're the youngest project, and they're just getting into this sort of cloud space. I also want to point out again, like the Dask Spark parity. Dask and Sparker, Dask is like 20, 30 percent slower. Not a not a ton. Uh, and DuckDB is still doing quite well. We're now going to switch from 32 cores up to 128 cores. So we're going to increase machine size. Uh, and generally, Dask and Spark come down, uh, and Polars and DuckDB kind of stay with stay where they are. Uh, it's hard to tell, but the the y-axis is roughly the same here between these two charts. I apologize; I should just like made the y-axis the same so the charts would be more comparable. Um, so the story here could be just like I think we've hit the scalability limit of DuckDB and Polars. They're not getting any faster. We had more hardware, uh, while Dask and Spark do increase as we had hardware. They're getting faster. The counter argument is that, like, uh, so Dask, Spark, and DuckDB are all kind of comparable with this amount of hardware, uh, but DuckDB can do the same performance at just like less hardware. Uh, it's impressive. But if we start adding more hardware, I think Dask and Polars will, will just scale a bit better. Uh, I'm going to switch now, uh, same compute hardware, but switching now to, a, to the scale of 1000, so roughly a terabyte. I'm also not going to include polars in the next charts because polars just like wasn't designed for this. Uh, it didn't complete the queries. Um, also, oddly, the like the color. I'm just using a charting library that doesn't have. I haven't specified colors, so red is now PySpark rather than polars. There's 128 cores at a terabyte, um, and generally, Spark starts to come into its own here. And I suspect we're going to go 10 terabyte next. I suspect Spark will continue to win. Um, so again, we're just sort of seeing how these things play off with different, different scales, which is fun. Um, so again, just, I did all these last night. This is super early work. We've been playing with this for the last like week or so. And it's actually been really surprising to us how well Dask has done. It's certainly not like winning this competition, but it's also not last place, which is fun. Um, yeah. 
There's also a lot of performance left. As we've been looking at all these comparisons, it's actually kind of fun to see what um, what's what's slow, what's fast. Why are we so much slower than Project X in this case? We should be just as fast. And there's a lot of sort of, I think, low hanging fruit on the table. So we're excited over the next couple of weeks to see what we can do. Um, a brief note on how this is implemented. So this is all inside the GitHub repository, uh, Coil Benchmarks, which is public. There's just a bunch of PyTest files. Uh, they look like this. So for Dask stuff, we're using fixtures to set up all the infrastructure on Coiled. We then run normal Dask code. For the single machine libraries, for DuckDB and for Polars, we're using Coiled functions. Coiled functions is like a way to run a Python function on a VM. Uh, it's really easy. If other people, like say Rapids, wanted to run infrastructure, this would be an easy way to ask for whatever infrastructure you want and run it. For Spark, it was interesting. We had two choices. We like were like, well, should we like figure out EMR or Databricks? It turned out to be easier just to have Coil support Spark. So Coil now has like a private don't tell anybody, but it has like a get Spark function, which just gives you a Spark cluster on demand, which is fun. Uh, so we're just running all that infrastructure also on Spark on Coil, which is neat. Um, I have written uh, about bias benchmarks. I was really hard to do benchmarks well. Uh, so some brief notes. Um, we didn't choose the benchmark set. We chose what someone else had chosen. Uh, every other system already has things about how they've been optimized for this. We're also reaching out to people who know these systems well. The folks at Sync Computing, which is like a Spark optimization shop, talked to us about Spark. Reached out to Richie. Haven't heard back yet, but I'll try to connect in the next couple weeks. I honestly haven't tried to talk to DuckDB folks because they're doing pretty well so far. This is also super, super early. Please don't take any of this seriously yet. Um, I ran these all last night. If I like go on coiled um, and go to DAS benchmarks, we can go and look at various things that were run recently. So let's go look at TPCH Dask thousand. And we'll grab this one and we'll go and look also at maybe uh, DuckDB 100. And so this is just showing you like 14 hours ago I ran this. This was literally last night. And we can go and see, you know, for every query, what the code was run and what sort of benchmarks and metrics look like. So it's been fun. We've been all playing with this internally. Um, and it's just been, yeah, it's been neat. So that's it. Um, I think that's all I got. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Does anyone have any questions for Matt? I can so it sounds like next steps are, oh, sure. Yeah, Deepak, go for it. Yeah, just quickly. Do you know why DuckDB is so good? What are they doing? That's a good question. I mean, DuckDB is just like famously very good. Um, like I think they're just like well optimized. I think really the question is like, what are we doing that's bad? Um, yeah. I think my experience is that like high performance computing, especially in cloud, isn't about doing one thing well, it's about doing nothing poorly. And so like we noticed, for example, that we are downloading twice as much data as DuckDB. Like mm -hmm. maybe error was pulling in bytes, it doesn't need to be pulling in. Um, we noticed that when we're reading Parquet on a single machine, actually like 90% of the flop cycles like actually is in the Parquet um, uh, deserialization rather than in disk speeds. Also, our CPUs aren't fully utilized. Great, that's the thing we can improve. Uh, I think what I'm excited about is that that difference in performance, that performance gap, actually points to a lot of places where we can actually perform a lot better. There's a lot of room for improvement in those gaps. Um, and so I, I, there's quite possibly like a few 2x improvements that we can pull out here. And then we get to a point where we're like, I don't know, half the speed of DuckDB, but with the scalability of Spark. And that's that starts to become pretty interesting. Um, I should also note that a, a, representative, a representative that's not here is Spark with Photon. So like Databricks has their own Spark implementation. And I haven't run that here, but it would be interesting to try to. But in general, like we're doing pretty well and like we've been optimizing for a week. Uh, and so I think there's gonna be probably a lot of a lot of good, a lot of good growth opportunity here. Good. Thanks. Okay, with that, uh turn it over to Joe to talk about Array Lake. Cool. All right, let's jump in. So um hello everyone. I'm Joe. Um I work at Earthmover. I'm the CTO there. We've been building Array Lake for the last year. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm also an X-Ray and Czar developer. I'm going to 
uh, show off both of those. Uh, I've also worked on a handful of DAS projects over the years. Um, you can find me on the internet in those places. So I'm going to very briefly run through a brief background on how kind of Czar and Dask work together, because that's actually the story of how Array Lake uh, and Dask work together. Um, and then I'm going to show off a few of the core features of Array Lake. I won't have time to get into all of them, so I'm just going to do like the first one or two and then uh, leave some for the imagination or for, for further reading. So uh, just like really quickly on the background. So I'm going to be talking about Czar. Czar is a storage format for storing hierarchies of chunked, compressed, and dimensional arrays. Think of it like a cloud native HDF5 or uh, or similar, or like a multi-dimensional parquet in many ways. Uh, its core features are that multi-dimensional array uh, format. You can chunk or partition your arrays along any dimension. You can store those arrays on a variety of storage backends. So today we're going to use S3 and Array Lake, uh, but you can put them in a zip file, um, in memory, in a bunch of places. Basically, anything that can look like a dict. Uh, it supports, and very importantly for Dask, it supports reading and writing arrays concurrently from multiple threads or processes. Uh, it has uh, some primitive synchronization, uh, and today we're not going to have to touch any of that. Uh, and then I've already mentioned, like, it's a tree-like data structure where the leaves of that tree are arrays. So that's Czar. Uh, it's a fun project. If you haven't seen it before, take a look. I don't need to tell you what Dask is. I'm just going to say that we're going to use the Dask Array API, uh, and we're going to plug that into Czar. And I'll move on from there. Uh, Czar is already well supported by Dask, so we're going to start doing an interactive demo here. Uh, I'm going to get a store from S3FS uh, that points to this Czar data set in S3, uh, and I'm going to open it up, and you can see, yes, I have an array. It's about three gigabytes. It's got uh, chunks of 31 megabytes, and Dask just knows what to do here. Uh, Dask and X-Ray also play nice together uh, in conjunction with Czar. So here I'm going to open up an entire group. So this has four variables. The air temperature one is the same one we saw before. And again, Dask is behind the, the scenes here. It's ready to do computation on this uh, you know, array that's broken up into 100, 100 blocks. So this is really nice. Like it, it, it has really unlocked the ability to do out of core computation on really large arrays. Obviously, this array not that large, uh, but we we can see arrays and in, you know into the many terabytes um, and collections of arrays into the petabyte scale uh, in in Czar. So uh, now I'm going to talk about Array Lake um, with with that covered. So uh, Array Lake is Earthmover's data lake platform for managing multidimensional arrays and metadata in the cloud. It's four main features. And kind of think of, well, I'm just going to tell you what the features are. The data catalog provides transactions and commits, uh, version control, uh, immutability, and time travel. And then finally, the ability to ingest archival files, so things like HDF5 or TIFF, as cloud optimized arrays. Um, we call them virtual files. My demo is highly likely to run out of time right around two, uh, transactions and commits. And so uh, you can look at the docs here uh, and we can go from there. OK, so the first thing, data catalog. This is kind of boring, uh, but also like such a hard problem for so many teams that are working with data that's in flight and uh, with, with multiple folks. So you know, the problem is that like if you're just using S3 to store uh, czar, You've got like a collection of binary blobs and JSON blobs, and well, S3 is not great at telling understanding either of those and giving you much insight into what's there. Uh, and so um, folks end up building their own data catalog. So you might use intake, you might use a spreadsheet, you might use your own relational database. Uh, but then the trick is like, how do you keep those in sync? So you, oftentimes we'll see people that have like a text file, like an intake catalog, quickly comes out of sync with their with their uh, actual data storage, data holdings in S3. So, you know, without any of this, like you can use S3 as a data catalog. Like here, I'm just listing this directory and say, like, oh yeah, okay, like, let's take a look at 2023. That's where we're at. Okay, so here we go. I can see that there's nine, you know, those nine months. I can uh, list this month, oops. Uh, and, and you see like, eventually I can drill down and figure out that there's some actual data in here. And I've now like found some of these data sets and, 
In fact, these are the data sets I just opened and showed you how to use with, with Dask and, and X-Ray. So that works, uh, but you know, again, S3 doesn't really know anything about this. So what Array Lake provides is a data catalog that allows you to kind of organize all this in a, in a sane way. And you can think of how it's organized, how Array Lake's organized similar to GitHub. So you have organizations, each organization has a you know, collection of repositories. And within each repository is a czar hierarchy in it that shares a common version history. And all the way down at the bottom, you have, so you have groups, you got arrays and you have chunks. Uh, and that's what we'll interact with today. So let's jump into it. Dask Distributed and Array Lake both have a client. So we have a competition for some namespace here. Uh, so I'm gonna in, go ahead and collect or connect to the uh, Array Lake service uh, and with, with the Array Lake client. And then I've just created a, a local cluster here um, with 16, and uh, uh, this machine has 16 cores. Uh, we're gonna create a new repository and we're gonna ingest some data. And I'm just gonna click this cause it takes a few seconds. Oh, I'm supposed to show this too. Let's see if we can get here in time before it. The machine's kind of busy. Uh, okay, we're gonna let this go for a second. Um, I bet if I click here, this will work. Okay, so uh, I was hoping to use the the Dask uh, um, Jupyter uh, extension, but oh, now it's obviously connected. So. The, the, what what we did here is we ran a, um, a little ingestion pipeline. So what we, we looped over two variable names, we opened up two our data sets that were somewhere else, and we did a little bit of light rechunking, uh, and we um, wrote them to uh, to Zar here. I actually like grabbed those as delayed tasks in Dask, uh, and then computed them at the same time. So what we did is we threw like a handful of arrays at uh, at array lake at once and Dask um, handled all of the writing there for us. Um, and when that finished, uh, we can now go ahead and look at the hierarchy in array lake. So here's our little widget. You can see that we wrote, I think eight arrays um, within two uh, kind of edge, edge uh, groups. And so already we have like a better representation of how our data is laid out than you know S3 would have given us. Um, and uh, and and so we, like this is just like uh, array like has slid in where where S three was and we'll, we'll talk about some some more of the features um, in a second but but a few folks are wondering how like X ray Dask and Zar communicate with array lake so I'll just answer that question really quickly so array lake provides this store interface that I mentioned earlier so this you know we we created our repository earlier here's our repo dot store object so. This is just a czar store and it's supported by by array lake it's like one one of the primary ways to interact with, with the data and so you can do pass this to anything that understands how to work with czar python um, including x-ray in this case uh like most other czar stores like this store can be serialized and sent off to workers so when you know x-ray creates a dask array under the hood and then you know dask array says like to store whatever it says under the hood and that gets distributed out to all the workers. Like this, this works just um, transparently uh, in, in the way that all other stores do. And then of course, under the hood, Array Lake's making a mix of like HTTP and S3 calls to write metadata to the, to our metadata service and uh, in chunks off to the to S3. So, okay, that's what happened behind the scenes there in our little ingestion pipeline. Ingestion pipelines are never like really pretty. And this is like as short as the pipeline as you can write in, for a demo. But let's do some let's do some more interesting stuff. So uh, I said version control, so we can actually uh, commit this uh, these changes. And I can then uh, go browse this data catalog uh, in, uh, in, in our web app. So now I can immediately go take a look here at, um, at the uh, at this array, so we can see now we can actually like inspect the the information about this. This is like far richer than you'd ever get with S3. You can see the metadata. You can see how the data is laid out um, in in Zar as well. Okay, so uh, we can also just pull this back and let's um, come on, Jupiter. Jupiter. Okay, here we go. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up this data set with, um, with X-ray. So I said chunks equals this empty dict, and that just means use the chunks on disk. Uh, and then um, we'll go ahead and we'll just grab one time slice out. And so we'll see Dask just quickly ran a few tasks, pulled out a map. So uh, we can now pull that data back out using the same sort of semantics. All right. My last one minute, I'm going to show you quickly how transactions and commits work. Um, and so this is like a, a persistent problem. Like if you've got like one person reading and one person writing to the same czar array, uh, there's no way to kind of isolate those two. And so what we'll do here is we'll load up a second month of data. We're going to pin this. So see a pin dim uh, time equals zero. So we're going to pin this data to the one of the arrays that we already had. Um, it's firing off some work. Ask running that for us and quickly just uh, show you what the like time series uh, averaged over those two months looks like. So you can see here the time axis has two months now. Uh, and we're also going to just point out that there's 1400 time points here. So now we're going to switch to a second reader. So we're going to simulate that with this repo two object. But this is one of you on your laptop trying to access the same data. And you'll see this reader, because I haven't committed that append step yet, is only seen 744 um, time points. I'm now going to commit that. And we'll repeat that step. You see that um, now we uh, now both readers see uh, the um, the 1400. So quick summary, and I'll uh, hopefully have a minute for questions. So array like this data lake platform that we've been building for managing multidimensional arrays, and metadata in the cloud. Uh, it builds on the czar storage format. So things that understand czar uh, should work well here. Um, and, you know, we've been working with Dask for a long time and, you know, Zara and Dask have a, have a long history together. So in, in many ways, we've designed this interface to work really well with Dask workload. So if you have arrays, you want to store them in the cloud, don't, uh, you're finding that S3 is not the best place for you uh, and, or not giving you all the functionality you need in terms of data catalog and versioning and transactions and all that. Um, array like might be interesting. And, um, yeah, we just uh, launched our private beta. So there's a link here and I'll put it in the chat um, and you can take a look. Stop there. Cool. Awesome. Um, okay, so with that, thanks Jim. I can turn it over to Matthias to talk about Fonda. All right. <clears throat> Let me share my screen. Yeah, hey everyone, I'm Matthias. I'm working for ML6. So ML6 is uh, an AI consultancy where we work with a lot of clients and try to yeah bring value to them by using AI in general. Uh, and during the last couple of months, we spent some work on building an open source framework to make data processing and the process of building data pipelines more easy, accessible, and a bit simpler in general. Uh, the reason for that is uh, we're working with a lot of clients and Often they really focus on bringing models to production, but lose track of the data itself. But we think, especially in times of uh, foundation models and large language models, the data gets uh, like a key part of the overall infrastructure and then training of models. Um, so what we have tried with Fondor is basically to, to build an open source framework um, to uh, yeah get us composable pipelines uh, by using reusable components. So we are offering a bunch of components that you can use plug and play to build a whole pipeline. Um, so yeah, why I am here. So the reason is for each pipeline step, we are using Dask under the hood. So our idea is that uh, the component contain, like consumes the Dask data frames operates on the data frame itself and also produce a data frame. So we can chain together different components operating on DAS data frames to, to build a complex data pipeline. Um, what I want to showcase here at the demo day, um, just how you can build your own component by using a Fondant interface um, and use your own component uh, in a Fondant pipeline. So some weeks ago, we I've published a data set uh, containing 25 million Creative Commons images. So basically images that you can use for your own purpose, like training model or something like this. Um, 
We did it by um, creating a data pipeline that we applied on the common crawl, what is basically a dump of the whole internet. And we just extracted pages uh, where we can find the um, Creative Commons license and then we create a big image data set. Um, and this data set uh, you can use to uh, just use uh, for a little pipeline and try to yeah extract some other images. So let me share my IDE to get into some code. Um, so as mentioned, Fondor itself is based on, on Dask data frames, and we are shading different components together, right? The uh, first component consumes the Dask data frame, the second component consumes the Dask data frame, and so on. So before I go to the pipeline definition, we first have to look at the component itself. So a component contains of uh, three main parts. In the heart of our components are component specification files, where we define basically the structure of the data frame that is consumed by the component. So assuming you want to construct a pipeline that takes the image data set and just filter out images that are of a specific file type, for example, PNG files, um, we can construct a component that consumes um, columns containing images that we can see here. So consume section, we are consuming uh, images containing image URLs from type string, apply some operations and as well. The component is producing a data frame containing as well images uh, URLs from type string. Um, a component also takes uh, a bunch of arguments. In this case here, we want to pass the MIME type just to filter on a specific MIME type on, on the images. Um, this is basically the heart of any component. Uh, any reusable component has as well a component specification that clearly defines what goes in, what comes out. Uh, what else is there? Um, we have um, a Docker file that basically um, builds the whole component and make it accessible through a container. That makes it easy to execute the component separately. Um, what you need then is to implement the component logic. Um, therefore, we offer a bunch of different um, classes that you can inhabit from. Um, in this case here, we're using a, a Dask transform component. So the idea is that you just have to, can almost copy paste the boilerplate uh, and just modify a transform method. So it's super like simple sample by uh, yeah, just overwriting the transform method. We take the data frame that we have to find in the specification file, um, like um, apply a transform method that just in this case, guessing the MIME type. And then finally we filter out uh, the MIME type so that we return a data frame that only contains uh, images that are not from, that are from the MIME type that we have passed this argument. Um, that's basically how we define simple components. Um, what we can do with that is basically we found a way to build a pipeline by using our own components. So it's quite similar. We um, define just a pipeline object, uh, give the pipeline a name, define a base path. Uh, so usually the base path is uh, a cloud storage bucket. So for example, a GCP bucket or an AWS F3 bucket, but you can use as well a local path. Um, for the sample pipeline here, uh, I'm using a reusable components that we are offering in our GitHub. So I can share a link afterwards that you can have a look there. Um, the first component basically initialize the data set from Hugging Face Hub that I just showed some minutes ago. Um, then the second component is basically the components that we have to find in our own component here in the filter file type component. And after all, we can just add them to our pipeline definition. So basically this code combines a reusable component on the hub plus a custom component. Um, this advantage from DAW is now that we can 
easily execute the pipeline locally. So we do have a CLI um, that allows us the execution of the pipeline on different environments. Uh, for local development, the easiest way is just to run uh, Fondor run local pipeline. Um, and then all pipeline steps get built to Docker files and chained together by using Docker Compose. It's good for local development, doesn't scale so much, so um, you can use it on VM. But if you want to go to production, we also offer um, possibilities that you can basically compile the pipeline to a Kubeflow pipeline definition or even uh, Vertex AI that you can then execute the pipeline on big machines on, on in the cloud. Um, so yeah, that's basically from dawn in a nutshell. It was quite a rush, <laughs> uh, but I thought, uh, yeah, we just have some minutes left. Um, any questions? I don't have a question, but I do want to say thanks, Matthias, for the presentation. Um, it's really cool to see. Yeah, any any other questions that folks might have for Matthias? Uh, yeah, um, have you done any scaling studies with this, or are you using it internally? Um, yes, we did. So, uh, as mentioned, the the image data set that I just showed uh, that is available on Hangi Face Up, we created this one with a uh, Fondor pipeline. So we built a pipeline and analyzed uh, one, two, three crawls in total uh, of the common crawl and extracted a lot of images. So it scales well. Um, of course, you can just use for now one machine, but we're actually looking into um, implementing you know, distributed workloads as well. Okay, awesome. If not, that's fine. Uh, thanks, Joe, for uh, posting the Earth Mover beta link in the chat. So anyone who wants to sign up and give that a try, feel free to go go uh, check out that link. Okay, if there aren't any other questions from folks, it was good seeing everyone. I just want to thank all the speakers again for the presentations. And yeah, I'll see y'all next month. Thanks, everyone. Great job. You.